Hi. In our last video, we started to review the anatomy of the respiratory system. We covered the nasal cavity in a great detail and saw why it has certain adaptations so that it can best serve its functions. On this video, we will return to this diagram. And as you probably remember, we already covered the two first parts that we set out to study, the nose and nasal cavity. And we also discussed about the paranasal sinuses. Now, as we continue to follow the path of the air and its travel further down, we are ready to shift our focus to the next part, the pharynx. So let's have a look of it. So pharynx is this muscular tube that runs posterior to the nasal cavity, all the way down to the start of the larynx, roughly at the level of the vertebra C6. Its function is, I would say, to connect the nasal cavity and oral cavity to the larynx and ossifides. And Interestingly, you will notice here that it is, as I mentioned, a muscular tube. This muscle is actually skeletal muscle. You might remember our review of the muscle tissue types from our earlier intro classes. If not, check out the link that I have added to the end of this video. Pharynx is divided in three parts that we will have a look. And let's start with nasopharynx. Nasopharynx is located posterior to the nasal cavity, and it runs from there to the level of soft palate and uvula. These close, separating the nasopharynx during the process of swallowing. So anyone who has ever had soda or milk climbing up there as this mechanism has temporarily failed, knows why these normally get separated during the process of swallowing. Another thing to notice is that within this area we have our pharyngeal tonsils and also the opening of an auditory tube, which I mentioned in the last video. Let's have a look of oropharynx. This space runs posterior to the oral cavity from the level of soft palate to the epiglottis. Palatine tonsils are located here as well as lingual tonsils. And finally, we have our laryngopharynx. This is posterior to the upright epiglottis and it extends to the larynx from where it continues as ossophagus. So those are our three regions of pharynx. And the next one that we will have a look of is going to be our larynx. This is sometimes referred in layman's terms also as our voice box but it does much more. It runs from the third to sixth cervical vertebra, attaching superiorly to the hyoid bone. It also opens posteriorly into laryngopharynx, and anteriorly it is continuous with the trachea. And when you think of the larynx, probably the easiest way to think about it is the nine cartilages that Form it. And many of you might be familiar with some of their external anatomy. And again, thinking about the tissue types, we have talked previously about hyaline cartilage. If you have forgotten this tissue, you can find a link to a video about that discussing the, these at the end of the report. Maybe that will help as a reminder. Please note, though, that although these cartilages make much of the larynx, it also is made of a combination of muscles and elastic connective tissue. We will focus on the cartilages. So let's have a look 
of these cartilage parts that make up the larynx. So what we see here is a view from the anterior side on the left side of the screen and a sagittal section on the right side of the screen. You will also notice that I had to scale these a little differently so that I could fit in everything to this screen. And next, we will go through all the nine cartilages that make up the larynx. Let's start with the largest and most prominent one, the thyroid cartilage. There's one of these. And this cartilage contains a part that is commonly known as the Adam's apple. The proper anatomical term for this is the laryngeal prominence. And you might remember that it is typically more prominent in men. And thyroid gland, which we talked about at the start of this course, is located at this level. So this can be a good anatomical landmark for locating it. And now let's shift our focus to the cricoid cartilage. It is a ring-shaped structure. In fact, the only fully closed ring-like stru structure in the larynx. And it forms the most inferior part of the larynx. Trachea begins from here, moving downward. And again, on some individuals, it is possible to feel it if you want a surface anatomy landmark. And next, we will look at the epiglottis. Again, as with the previous ones, there is one of these. And the function of this flap-like structure is to close and seal off the respiratory pathway when one swallows. At all other times, it is open. This is important because you might remember from our first video, inserting constant clear airway is one of our top priorities. Here I have an interesting figure for you. It is an epiglottis that is unusually tall one. It extends higher up, so more superiorly than usual. So rather unusually, it could be seen from the mouth. Let's go through the rest of the cartilage parts that make up the larynx. There are two peritoneoids, one on each side. They are located and closed inside the thyroid cartilage, so only visible on this cross-section view, as we have the case here. So let's describe them a little. They are triangular cartilage structures. And the reason why they are so important for us is that as muscles control their movement and cause them to move, they manipulate the tension of the vocal cords. I have colored them a little darker on this diagram. Hopefully that will help you to spot the vocal cords. Now, let's look at the corniculates. Again, two of those, both on top of each of our arytenioids. So you can consider those as little tiny tips on top of them. And finally, I want us to look at the cuneiforms. These are actually located within the mucous membrane lining, so normally they are not visible for us. So that's it. Those are our cartilage parts of the larynx. But we should also talk a little bit about the function of larynx. Well, first and most obvious one is that it provides the airway. So it is here that the air passes along to and from the trachea. Then note that it is a structure that has an important role in routing the air and food into correct paths, respectively, either towards oesophagus or trachea. This is, of course, important. And 
Finally, this is where the voice production takes place. I mentioned earlier the vocal cords and arytenoids playing a role in controlling how tight these vocal cords are. Let's have a little look in further detail and consider the vocal cords a little more. So, vocal cords are located deep to the laryngeal mucosa, attaching to the arytenoid cartilages. These were these ones that we just saw as we reviewed the parts of the thyroid cartilage. What is interesting is that these vocal cords appear white because elastic fibers that they are made of do not have blood vessels in them. So, hence the color. And here on this view, which was acquired with a technique called laryngoscopy, we actually see these white structures made of elastic fiber. Just as we noted. And there is another term that I want to highlight here. Glottis refers to this space that is opening between the vocal cords. Some prefer to call it rima glottis too. This is more common, especially at the old continent where I was trained. So we manipulate the glottis to alter the sound generated by the vibrating ear mass passing through the vocal cords. So there are two sets of vocal cords that I want us to talk about. More superiorly, something that we call as false vocal cords. This is because if we study these in more detail, they are not really involved with vocal production. And then we have more inferiorly the true vocal cords. It is the edges of these that vibrate as the airstream passes through and the voice is produced. Do notice, however, that the voice is also further manipulated higher up at this path, all the way to and within the mouth. And just as a side note regarding this, let's have a look at something fun. If you have never heard about this instrument that you see here, it is called a didgeridoo. This instrument originated from Australia. And the reason why I mention it is that I used to live there. And how you play this instrument is interesting. You manipulate the opening of your glottis, in fact, restricting the opening of glottis, and if you have trained your vocal tract muscles, you can generate this very distinctive sound. You can check it if you, for example, want it on YouTube. And all this discussion brings us to talk about a clinical relevance of tracheotomy. This is an incision in the windpipe aimed to relieve issues that are caused by an obstruction higher up. And this diagram shows that the positioning of this incision is very important. Hence, I wanted to bring it up at this point. It can really save lives, but you also need to know your anatomy exactly to be able to do it successfully. And now we are ready to start talking about the trachea. So this is, if you wish, our wind pipe as sometimes called in layman's terms. Let's have a look at this structure. Trachea connects the larynx to the lungs. Average adult's trachea is about 2.5 centimeters in diameter and between 12 and 13 centimeters in length. As a structure, it is very flexible with only complete ring being at the most superior part, the cricoid cartilage, which we just had a look of a few moments ago. All other cartilages here are C-shaped cartilage rings. And this would be a good time to consider why would this be the case? 
Well, there is actually a fairly logical explanation. Of course, these cartilage rings are there to strengthen the structure, keeping the airway open. This was super important for us, right? But they are not complete rings for a very good reason. So let's be a little creative with this diagram of an individual that I drew here. Of course, the proportions here are not correct, but I want to highlight something. We are looking down at the level of the trachea. Left side is where our face and all other anterior parts would be. And as I said, we are looking downwards from the top. Notice that the trachea with its C-shaped cartilage rings and that it is more anterior. And posteriorly, this is ossophagus. So in case there is something large that needs to go down your ossophagus, it can actually extend a little bit to the space normally held by the trachea. This is thanks to these cartilage rings being open from the back. I hope that this makes sense now. I also want to mention that where the trachea ends at the level of mediastinum, it divides into two primary bronchi. And at this point, where it divides, is an important structure for our clinical use. It's called carina. And for example, when you put a camera down someone's windpipe, when we see this point, it is an important landmark. And there is one more important thing that I want to talk about here. The wall of the trachea is covered with these little hair-like structures known as cilia. They play an important role, sweeping any impurities away from there towards the throat. Another clinically relevant point that we should talk about is the angle at which the primary bronchi enter the lungs right after the hyla. And we know that the angle is typically steeper for the right primary bronchi and therefore it is the right lung where most foreign objects normally end up. And I guess that there is one more important term that I want to mention this time here. So let's go back to this figure and you see the gray arrows that are pointing to the site where the primary bronchi enter the lungs. Well, this is called hilum. And of course, we will notice that as we continue down the respiratory tract, there are more and more branches that divide it. It divides into. In fact, 23 times, and each of these has a name based on the size of the branch in relation to the whole. So we have our primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, segmental or tertiary bronchi, bronchioles, and eventually terminal branches. And that concludes our discussion of the trachea and its branches. Now, let's move on and finish this video by looking at the lungs a bit more in detail. So, the lungs take up almost the entire thoracic cavity with the exception of the mediastine. Also note that they start high up. the apex of the lungs. This is the most superior tip and it is located deep to the clavicle. You might remember the term the apex being used also with heart. See how these terms are being recycled. And the lungs run all the way down to the diaphragm. The inferior surface of the lungs rests on this diaphragm here. This is known, of course, as the base of the lungs. Note how far the lungs continue 
at the lateral sides too. See where the diaphragm attaches to. This structure continues laterally more inferiorly than people typically think. We have already earlier discussed about the hilum. This was on the mediastinal surface, so the space between the lungs. And the hilum is an area where the bronchi as well, as blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerves, they all enter and exit to the lungs. And I will leave the rest for you to review independently. Another thing that I do want to discuss with you, though, is the lobes and major fissures that make up the right and left lung. To start with, I want to draw your attention to the fact that the left lung is clearly smaller in size. This is because we have the heart there in the mediastinum. Remember that the heart is located slightly left from midline, so it takes some space from the left lung. And actually, this indentation of the heart in the left lung shape is known as cardiac notch. Now I want us to review the lobes on both the left and right side. And remember, when using these terms, left and right, we always talk as referring to the patient's right and left. That's just as a reminder, it is important to be clear about this. So what we see here is that on the right side, remember right lung was bigger, we have three lobes. While on the left, where we have the smaller lung, here we have only two lobes to worry about. This right lung was smaller, so this is rather intuitive. And these lobes are called on the right side, from the top to the bottom, superior, middle, and inferior lobes. And on the left, superior and inferior lobes. And another important term is a fissure. Remember from our discussion of the surface anatomy of the brain and even the surface anatomy of the heart, a fissure was some kind of a depression a line that runs on the surface of a structure. So on the lungs, we have two fissures on the right lung. Horizontal fissure separates the superior and middle lobes on the right lung. And oblique fissure separates middle and inferior lobes. On the left side, since we have only two lobes, we have only one fissure. This is the oblique fissure, and it separates, obviously, the superior and inferior lobes. So we should be feeling pretty comfortable with these terms. Now, let's have a closer look at the surface of the lungs. We will go in even more detail and look at the sac around the lungs. And what I have here is a diagrammatic representation of an enlarged area. And as you can see, there are actually two layers around the lung and a space in between them. And the innermost layer is known as the visceral pleura, while the outermost is the parietal pleura. And what is worth noticing is that there is a space between the two, and it is filled with fluid. Why would there be this space enclosed by two pleura and some fluid inside it? Why would it be surrounding the lungs? <laughs> well, this fluid helps to lubricate the sliding of these two layers against each other. It also cushions as a whole structure. And finally, it helps to generate a negative pressure that causes the lungs to expand. 
So that is a few important points about our pleura around the line. Now let's look at this slide and notice that our bronchial tree and its wall structure changes throughout its length. So, as we move further down the respiratory tree, we will notice that the wall structure changes. Initially, higher up, there is more cartilage. And as we move further down the tree, the amount of cartilage decreases and the amount of smooth muscle increases. And the very last thing that we will talk about on this video at the very end, is at the very end of the bronchial tree, alveoli. So what we notice is that we, as we move down the bronchial tree and smaller and smaller structures become present, at the very end we have something called alveolar sacs. These are made of a clusters of alveoli. And it is at this level where the gas exchange happens. And they make the bulk of the lung volume too. And the final point that I want to make is that these clusters allow alveoli to have a very rich blood supply directly next to them. This capillary network around them and you might also remember the very thin wall thickness here. The thin wall of an alveoli facilitates optimal exchange of gases. So that's it for this video. We have covered a lot and I feel that this is a good place for us to take a break here. In the next video, we will start putting some physiology into this discussion of ours about the respiratory system. Until then, take care.